Hi, and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Kim and Aline, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, this summer marks the 10th annual summer of the BU Stay True Summer Basketball Camp. The founder of the BU Stay True program sits down to talk about how this program has helped many kids. Then ECE On The Move is a group of more than 600 early childhood educators working in residential settings in New York City. The Chief Operating Officer of ECE On The Move joins me in studio to speak on their mission. After that, this June on BronxNet, we acknowledge Aphasia Awareness Month. A board member of the National Aphasia Association talks in detail about how this condition affects people all over. And finally, the Here We Are campaign is a groundbreaking video campaign that shares the real stories of transgender people. The transgender advocacy consultant for GLAAD Media and a community advocate talks more about this groundbreaking video campaign. So stay tuned to all this and much more is headed your way because we're now officially open. Hello everyone, I'm Cuban Aline and today is Tuesday, June 11th. You are now watching Open, a program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to you. Don't forget to stay connected with us via social media at BronxNet TV. The organization BU Stay True celebrates 10 years of serving children through the sport of basketball. Founder of the organization Andrew Curiel now joins me to discuss reaching this milestone and ways your child can get involved with the basketball camp this summer. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. So excited to be here, Kevin, in person this time. Yes. So I wanted to say that we, we um, were able to speak before, but for those who probably missed that interview, can you give us a brief overview of the program BU Stay True? Absolutely. BU Stay True program is a nonprofit organization that was started here in the Bronx that promotes character building in the youth through the sport of basketball. What I've seen over my time playing basketball as a younger adolescent is like all those life lessons that we see on the court with coaches and games, things like that, they translate to life. So we're teaching those lessons to the young kids throughout their time in high school, also middle school and even elementary school. Now, what was the main objective when you established the camp? Yeah, 10 years ago, young Drew, 18 year old, was way different. So like understanding that camps cost a lot of money for kids and understanding that sometimes families can't afford a, a $300 weekend basketball camp or a $750 week long basketball camp. My partner and I, Nico, we want to transform that and change that dynamic and provide access to these kids and these families to provide free basketball camps. And that's what we did for about our first four years. And then year five, we saw it as like a business model with opportunity to gain more like awards, certificates, medals, trophies for the kids if we raise enough money throughout the like time that we were spending. Now you mentioned 10 years, which is amazing. Yeah. To celebrate 10 years of just anything, that's just a huge accomplishment. How are you celebrating this achievement? 10 years is amazing. I, what I see there is like passion has been purpose. And this past decade has been exactly that, like working in my purpose. And the way we're celebrating it is the same way that we started, our 10 year reunion basketball camp on June 22nd at the University of Mount St. Vincent, where myself and Nico both graduated from. And I currently work there now as the director of our Center for Leadership. It's gonna be an amazing opportunity where our kids come together, but also our volunteers, which are the college students that like I work with on the annual basis. So bring all those connections together to celebrate basketball, but most important to learn the importance of being you and staying true to who you are both on and off the court. Now, how has the organization evolved over a decade? And I'm also curious to know, how have you evolved um, you know, throughout this entire journey? It's changed so much from basketball camps in the Bronx to an opportunity to do a basketball camp in Ireland, because I got my master's over in Ireland, to an opportunity last year to do a basketball camp in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. And to do it over there is just to see how big our message of BU Stay True is and how it could start transforming lives. Um, even from just a basketball camp, we, we've been an organization that has raised money to provide laptops, computers, Chromebooks to my old elementary school, St. Helena's in the Bronx. And what we've seen is this BU Stay True program is less of a basketball program and more of a nonprofit youth development empowerment program that can empower anybody that understands the message of being you and staying true. Now, can you talk about the importance of character building programs for children in areas like the Bronx? Huge. I'm, 
being a resident of the Bronx, I've thought about that too. You go to school, you learn your academics, you go to sports, you, you get the information from there. But like, what is really developing you as the person that you truly want to be? God willing is coming from the family and, and those dynamics. But if it's not, what is the program that is providing that? I believe BU Stay True fills that gap. I see it in myself to answer your previous question, like the character building. Like, how are you developing as a young person in this world? I, I remember last year I told you, like, I see young people as sponges. They can absorb as much as they can, but like, what else are they reaping from that, from that information gathering? And for me and Nico, it's like, we're young, we're, you know, young black men in the Bronx that can continue to show our message of being you and staying true. So it's like, we could be that role model that we wish we had when we were younger to like be empowered to be ourselves. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think that children can often be uh, just misheard or like not heard or Super. misrepresented you know thinking about how you were when you when you were younger what are some qualities that you like you make sure that you have now as a leader that you want to provide for kids today inclusivity i think inclusivity is one of the biggest things all are involved all can participate all can be here because what i see is exclusive is like what deems to be like oh yeah that's exclusive i want to reach that status however at the end of the day we're all hum human people and that's what I see in the basketball camp. Like, it's changed from just having boys to having boys and girls, having people with disabilities still take part in the camp, or having people that don't play basketball at all but are just willing to try one day. And that's what I see. We have a low barrier to entry. That access is super important, and that's seen something that I've seen throughout my time. Inclusivity is so important, especially in the realm of sports and what we've seen now with women's sports, specifically basketball. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I, I know that I talked about that last year yeah. about the importance of being a role model um, for boys and having uh, young boys in the Bronx look up to people. But you mentioned that girls are also there so and good. basketball is huge for women right now. So can you talk about the importance of kind of, you know, having that space available for girls in the Bronx as well? It's so important. Right now, I'm looking at our coaches list. We have more women coaches than male coaches. Myself, Nico, and my boy, uh, Coach Shoppy, we're going to be the only male coaches and we have five female coaches and that's a representation of where the sport is going is growing so the same thing we want to be reflective of the dynamics but also the, the community that we're serving too I think it's important for young females to see other females be successful in their sport but also be successful academically as well these individuals that we're gonna have they're all University of Mount St. Vincent women's basketball players they just won a skyline championship most importantly they were all on Dean's list this past semester as well so it's that full representation and also inclusivity for those female students that we hope to see at our camp. Now, what are the benefits of offering sports and extracurricular activities in the Bronx, especially for children in the Bronx? It's, it's a safe haven. It really is. I, I mean, in my role, I see opportunities to connect students with like internship sites, job sites, and you see it. What, what are students doing after school? They're either at home or on the block, unfortunately. If we could provide that service to students where they know they have a community to go to, they have a mentor to reach out to, they have a connection, they have a community that they could really like embed themselves in, we could see students be more successful, quote unquote, both on and off the court, whether it may be in their academic, whether it may be in their entrepreneurial journeys, whatever it may be, but you'll see like that purpose would be more developed if they have that community to be like really be a part of. And then can you expand on the importance of physical activity just here in the Bronx as we know that unfortunately, yeah. you know, we are the unhealthiest borough. So I do think that I personally think it's amazing that there's something fun um, for kids to do in regard to physical activity. But can you expand on that? Heavy on the fun. So like <laughs> when we when we do our camp and we're doing all these conditioning drills to really like show them like sports takes you to be conditioned in order to compete right at a, at a certain level. We try to make it as fun as we can. What are those little competitions that you could do with yourself, you know, tricking your mind, but also supporting like the people around you as well. And what we do is like, we understand like our coaches, right? Yeah, there's a high level of basketball, but right now to show that basketball is this fun sport, we have to bring it down to their level. So how can we make the things more inclusive? How can we make the drills and the skills more fun? Because hopefully what I would love to see is our kids that take part in the camp, now they're more willing to try out for their team in school. Now they're more willing to take part in an organization on a weekend to be more physically fit. That's really the hope that I would love to see as well. Now, a really important thing is that it takes place on a college campus. Um, we can definitely already see how it benefits the children, but how does it also benefit the college students on the campus? I would say it's ingrained now. I mean, th there's such layover with my position at the university being an alumni, but also working there for five years now. It's like now people see me as like BU Stay True, but also Center for Leadership and what I do. But most importantly for our students, it's like now I'm seeing like a new generation of students that don't know about BU Stay True, but know me and now see the importance of like, oh, now I get why BU Stay True is so important. 
and literally on my whiteboard, like in my office, I have a list and things that I need for camp. And students just go in there and just write their name and just write their name. And I'm like, all right, you're volunteering? Like, you're going to be a part? And they're like, yes, I want to be a part. And what I found is now it's another community for them to feel ingrained and connected with. And what I love from it is like some are coaches, some are volunteers. And I told them the way you're going to be a volunteer is just be, be you. Ultimately, wherever we need you to be, be your most successful self. Try your best. Because what I found was some of our campers that come to the camp, some of the role models are not even the coaches. It's the volunteers or the social media people, or the photographers or the videographers. And I'm like, each one of you have a potential impact to mentor or show yourself as a role model to a kid. That is the role of what we're going to be doing at BU Stay True. Now, what are the requirements for joining the program? Six to 14. Um, and just be willing to come play basketball. Really, that's what it is. You know, sometimes I get parents that may ask, hey, I have a four or five year old. And of course, some of them may be a little bit more advanced or, or may not. But again, like I never really say no. <laughs> You're more than willing to come down. And what I find is if it's a little bit too much, then like the, the camper sits out. But if it's all good, they, they continue on with the camp. Six to 14, uh, some of our campers that have been campers in the past are coming back as volunteer coaches, volunteers in general. Oh, so it's cool to see that. Um, and ultimately, even for like our young uh, college students, it's like now the hope is once they come to the camp, now they come to your basketball games in the fall and during the winter season as they see you on the court too. That's amazing. And this is such an amazing program. And I can't believe this Thank started you. when you were 18. <laughs> That's you. truly amazing. Um, and so I'm so glad that you're able to kind of put this energy towards something yeah. amazing in our borough for the children in our borough. So thank you so much for joining us and having this discussion. Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you for the time. To learn more about this amazing program, please go to the website at BUStayTrueProgram.com. Don't go away. We'll be back with more open after this. So Bronx Night is a great place for anyone to come to if you're looking to learn how to uh, get yourself in the door, how to get your toes wet, if you will, when it comes to media, when it comes to editing. And I would definitely recommend it to anyone who really is interested in, you know, learning how to work, you know, whether it's in studio production, whether it's field production, whether it's learning how to operate a camera, whether it's learning how to uh, interview and host, uh, this is the place for you to be. This is the place for you to sort of get your feet wet and be amongst other creatives um, here in the Bronx who are also trying to learn and develop their own content. Welcome back. Early Childhood Educators on the Move, more commonly known as ECE on the Move, aims to give every educator in a residential setting the resources to improve quality care and navigate federal and state rules and regulations. Chief Operating Officer of ECE on the Move, Shanita Bowen, joins me to discuss this effort. Shanita, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about ECE on the Move and how the organization began? Oh, yes. Um, ECE on the Move began in 2018 uh, to satisfy um, the need for systemic issue for reform of systemic issues. We were finding that family child care educators in residential settings were having a hard time with um, their regulated with the licensors, with pay issues, many issues with agencies that uh, mandate us, and so we had to help and provide their voices to officials that needed to hear the problems that were going on. Now, um, 
as mentioned, this is specifically for educators who offer home-based childcare. Can you tell us a little bit more about that role specifically? So we, we are technically family child care providers, but we are family child care educators. And where do we work? In residential settings. It's so important to distinguish that, to amplify, to lift up the professionality of our sector. And our sector is that we work in the home. So we are more common, more, uh, you will find more of us in any given neighborhood because we're in buildings and, and, and in any, in, on any street. Um, so it's important to um, lift that sector up. Now, why was there a need to have a space specifically for early childhood educators? For ECE on the move, it was important because no one, th we're in a child care crisis and advocates were uh, addressing issues in the crisis, um, pay issues, all kinds of issues, but no one, uh, no one feels it better than the um, the workforce ourselves. So I am a previous family child care operator for 16 years and the founders Gladys Jones and Doris Irizarry uh, have operated their programs for 20 years or more. And so no one knows better than us on what our issues are in the sector and how, what we want to see happen so that we're thriving. Now can you just explain or expand, you know, how does the ECE provide support to educators? Yes. The system moves very slowly. So we, first of all, we have an empire on WhatsApp. So all of our providers, um, I would say over 600 family child care educators and the families that they serve. So imagine each provider has about an, a capacity of 14 to 16 um, spaces in their home. So that's how many parents we have access to. So it became important to address everyone's issues. And how do we do that? We, have a, we develop our own grievance system. So we develop a form and everyone is allowed, whether they're a family child care educator or a parent, if, they, if a, an educator is having an issue receiving her pay on time or she's having issues with her license and she's just not getting through to, uh, to um, agents or officials, we ask them to document it and we usher it over to an official who we believe can help. And we're doing this for all of the family child care educators and we're doing it for parents who have issues on a wait, uh, with a waiting list. Parents are waiting a long time for childcare and they want to know why. They want to talk to someone. And so because that's not readily available, we tell, document it, put it down here, and we'll take it to where we know um, we'll, you can get expedited help. So the best we can do is take everyone's issues and usher it to where we believe that they can get help immediately. So and this was not happening before. Wow. So, yeah, just explaining it and hearing it, there just mm -hmm. seems like there's so many layers, yeah. you know, um, that unfortunately a lot of people in this sector have to face. Now, I understand from personal experience you felt underrepresented in politics and policies that affect the industry. Can you just expand a little bit more on this experience? And I know it's not just you. Many people on the team kind of felt underrepresented. Yes. Uh, well, it is safe to say that those who make policy weren't very much in touch with grassroots, weren't very much in touch with the actual, those of us who are actually in the field. Uh, the legislators, the senators, the assembly are not used to family child care providers or, or, or any uh, child care givers coming to talk about pay issues or uh, other issues in the crisis. And there are many issues in the crisis. Um, and so, we're, that's what one of the things we do best in addition to addressing grievances we're also pairing everyone up with their legislators because the everything must come to light in order to make the systemic changes that we need now can you tell me about the march to the governor's office to urge new yorkers and elected officials to imagine a day without child care oh yes yes so uh, community for change sponsored uh the day without child care our founder, Gladys Jones, calls it imagine a day without child care because we didn't strike. We didn't, but we were going, this is a national day of action and we were planning on um, pairing uh, providers and parents with their legislators, having some conversations, uh, sharing information. But the minute the state budget dropped and it 
felt like a slap in the face that it just didn't support our industry, we pivoted. We had to march. We had to do it. We had to make a statement. At that point, we couldn't um, influence the budget, but we had to react to it. We had to show that this is unacceptable. There were no new dollars for our sector, and our doors are closing, and we're, we're in survival mode, family child care educators, and the child care uh, sector uh, throughout the state is in survival mode at this time. And I understand that so many people rely on child care that if it weren't there, people wouldn't go to work because they would like the, it actually is like part of such a huge cycle in our city yeah. that kind of makes things, you know, continue mm -hmm. moving on. And so I was really shocked to hear that. Can you just talk about what the response to Imagine a Day Without Child Care was like? Yes. Um, well, you know, we we started off at Bryant Park and we marched to the governor's office. When we told our providers, you know, you all see, they had spent the whole year lobbying. Uh, they themselves went to Albany and talked to their legislators. They themselves participated in hearing updates throughout the year. What's, what is going on? Keeping in touch, maintaining relationship with their legislators. When, so they were in tune to uh, hearing what the budget would bring. And we had heard for two years prior that child care is a priority. And so we just knew that this budget would uh, relieve us, would uh, uh, help us to live again. Um, but when that didn't happen and we went into our empire, WhatsApp empire, and talked to, because we, uh, we communicate with the providers on a daily basis, on the, and the parents on a daily basis, you know, on that, on that platform. And so when we went in and we said, what do you want to do? It, it was no question. Everyone wanted the march. We had never done it before. And so we knew that this was serious and everybody was willing to come. Um, it was, it was a, 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 a good number. It was uh, somewhere between 120 and 150. But those, these were those who weren't afraid to um, close their doors for the day, even for part of the day. And, and they were, you know, wild, riled up enough to uh, join. So when we walked to uh, the governor's office, I guess it was a great moment when the, uh, we call the bullhorn, the mega phone yeah, yeah, passed mega around yeah. and the providers were projecting to the eighth floor to the governor's office, no more broken promises. And you know, it was just to hear the educators speak in this manner and you know, want to take control over their own destiny. Now, can you just clarify what is needed from Governor Hogel to support early childhood educators? Yes. Ultimately, the North Star, and we want that North Star very quickly, <laughs> we need to be paid thriving wages. Right? Um, we need providers to be paid the true cost of care. And the true cost of care means that her assistance can be paid good wages that educators should be paid. We're, we're educating children zero to five and then after school programs. But we're the first line of defense. We're prepping children to move on into uh, other, other school. So it starts with us and we need to be heavily resourced and we need to be paid well. So cost of care means that everything that uh, goes into operating our small businesses, family child care educator, Let's, let's reel it back. A family child care educator is someone who's operating child care in her home. This is a business. This is a small business. Yes, we love working with the children, but this is a business and we want to be proud of our business. We want to be well resourced. We want to be able to offer the children as much as, as they need. Um, and we want to be able to pay the staff. We want to be able to pay ourselves because we're not just teaching, we're first. You have to very heavily resource and finance us so that we can take care of this program because we've been doing it off of nothing but that is unfair it is unfair to ask us to uh, fund uh, an entire program when we're a teacher nurse doctor therapist for the whole community for uh, very little uh, money and and the money is very small and i think it's so important that we're having this discussion because i think that just in general 
you know, in regards to education. There are already so many challenges that educators face, and I could imagine that these challenges are heightened when you kind of have to run your business. And as you mentioned, kind of take on so many roles. Right. You know, can you talk about how elected officials across the city can provide support to ECE? Yes. Make it their business to understand that child care is a part of the infrastructure, not only in New York State, but across the country. Child care, everyone needs it. Our founder, uh, Gladys, likes to say um, it should be as easy as breathing. It should come as easy as breathing. You know, everyone starts a, wants to start a family and have children. You need child care. You have grandchildren. You need child care. Child care is needed by everyone. And um, we need our legislators to understand the importance of it, make it a priority. Every, this is um, a Democrat and Republican. This is bipartisan. This, is, this child care affects everyone, and everyone needs it. So we need to take care of it. And so there was a study done out of Cornell University um, that says that the return on investment. So where is the political will if there is a return on investment? For every one dollar spent in child care, there's seven dollars. Right. And I hope I'm quoting, quoting, <laughs> quoting Cornell <laughs> appropriately. But when there's a, a return on investment, everyone needs it. This is a no-brainer. We, we all win. Right. Well, you know, I want to thank you so much for joining us and kind of really, you know, just educating, you know, our community on what is actually happening out there. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. To keep up with all the amazing work the ECE does, please go to their website at eceonthemove.com. Stay tuned, we have more from you right after this. Thank you, Bronx Ned. Congratulations on 30 years. What an amazing accomplishment. On behalf of myself, Alina Dow, and I represent the Dow Twins and the Dow Twins Show, who are young producers. They are they started, I think, when they were 11, and now they're 14. They started making 30-second little fun facts, and now they are doing 30-minute shows. And it goes to a testament of how much you guys do in the Bronx to make young people want to continue to be involved. I wish you 30 more amazing years and beyond. Thank you for what you do. Only 57% of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. Discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, Visit BronxNet.org to learn more. Welcome back. During the month of June, healthcare professionals recognize Aphasia Awareness Month. Dedicated to advocating for those living with this condition, the National Aphasia Association provides access to research, education, and rehabilitation. Board member of the NAA, Dr. Elizabeth Galetta, now joins me to discuss. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to be here. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about the condition aphasia and how it affects the lives of people who live with it? Sure. So aphasia is an acquired language disorder and it affects all modalities of language. So by that I mean oral expressive, lang oral expressive language, so talking, auditory comprehension, understanding, reading, and writing. It affects all modalities of language and it is caused by various factors. So a non-progressive aphasia is commonly caused by stroke and other brain conditions, whereas a progressive aphasia is another type of aphasia that is called primary progressive aphasia. That is a type of dementia. 
Now, can you tell me a little bit more about the NAA and the work the organization does? I understand that you're a board member. Yes, the NAA is amazing. Um, the NAA is a nonprofit organization supporting people with aphasia. Um, it started 37 years ago by Martha Taylor Sarno, who was one of the first and leading speech language pathologists in this country to work with people with aphasia in a hospital setting. Uh, she started working with people at NYU Medical Center in 1949 and started the National Aphasia Association that continues today to serve people with aphasia. Um, a primary role of the NAA or part of the mission is awareness. And so here we have Aphasia Awareness Month. Thank you again for inviting me to really help educate our communities about aphasia. Um, it, surprisingly, to me, as a speech-language pathologist that has really worked my whole career with people with aphasia, many people do not know what aphasia is. Um, less than 50% of individuals have heard the word aphasia or can define it, um, and they are aware of conditions that are less common, such as Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, um, yet aphasia uh, is unknown to many. So one of the mission, part of the mission is to get the word out like we're doing uh, during especially this month, as well as research supporting people with aphasia and helping people with aphasia live productive lives and then supporting families. A really big part of the NAA is to support individuals and families um, that are living with aphasia. Yes, and I understand the NAA is doing amazing work. I got to read up on it. Oh, I understand there's also like a space for people with aphasia, yes. you know, in the AA. Can you just kind of um, highlight that? Because I think that's pretty amazing. Yes, well, we have um, board members that have aphasia that are inform um, the work that we're doing. We have lots of other um, um, subgroups that are working on different projects. And, and actually there are, um, every week there are groups and um, uh, both groups, like community groups, where people with aphasia can um, have conversations with other people with aphasia, as well as other activities for people with aphasia. So we have people with aphasia kind of on the inside working with what is the NAA offers, as well as things for people all over the country who have aphasia. Now, is there any particular demographic that is most affected by this condition? I know that, um, as you mentioned, not a lot of people are aware of it, um, but I'm curious to know, is it affecting any demographics more intensely? So demographic is really um, tied to the underlying cause of aphasia. So I said stroke is a common cause of aphasia. We know that certain individuals or have stroke more commonly. Blacks, Latinx individuals have experienced stroke more commonly than whites, for example. As we age, um, stroke is more common. Also, in terms of demographic, if you look at the country nationally, stroke is more common in the south, so in the southern states. Um, those um, locations are more impacted by stroke. And then, you know, the numbers of the people with aphasia, that the people who've had a stroke who have aphasia are a little bit harder to determine, but we do know that about a third of people that have a stroke also have aphasia. And about two million people in this country are living with aphasia. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that information. I'm curious to know, um, as with many conditions, we often tend to look at, um, is it something that could be inherited or is it something that could you know, possibly run in the family? Do you guys see um, anything similar when it comes to this condition? Again, we have to look at the underlying cause of aphasia, the medical conditions that cause aphasia, right? So if someone has a history of stroke or heart disease or other health conditions that lead to stroke, then you could maybe tie it that way. Um, certainly primary progressive aphasia, which is a form of dementia, we know that there are um, genetics are tied to that. So in that sense, yes, but we also know that aphasia does not um, specialized, you know, really um, older people, younger people, and people from um, any group can have a stroke and can have aphasia. Now, can you discuss some of the challenges people with aphasia face regarding work and their communities? I know that NAA aims to address diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and social justice for people living with aphasia. Yes. I mean, think about it, right? Most of our work in this world involves communication, right? So anyone who is um, in a position where they acquire aphasia, it clearly impacts work. I mean, it clearly impacts our communication. And you know that is hugely challenging. I have to say that while most people do not really return to work in the same capacity, people do continue to work. So I think it depends on how you look at it, you know, um, depending on what your role is within your work setting. 
Uh, and then also people sometimes are able to get support. There is a specialty within rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation, that helps support people with disabilities in a work setting, so there can be accommodations. Um, and both our healthcare um, communities, as well as, of course, the National Aphasia Association, work to help support people to go back to work or to do other things um, similar or different from the things that they were doing prior to their acquiring aphasia. Now, yeah, and I think that's so interesting because, um, you know, this is the first time that I'm learning about it. And as you mentioned, so many people don't know. And I think that sometimes when people don't know things, um, they tend to have maybe misconceptions or ideas about people that may, um, may not be correct. You know, have you, in this work, have you found that people kind of carry any misconceptions about people living with aphasia? Yes, aphasia is not an intellectual disorder. It is an access problem, so people have their intellect, yet they have difficulty retrieving and accessing their language as they typically had done prior to having aphasia. So I think that is something that uh, the world has a hard time grappling with and understanding. Certainly we've had some um, more high profile individuals that have aphasia that have been um, in the news recently that I think has helped to sort of spread the word about what aphasia is. But I think you having me here and really um, helping us spread the word about aphasia during Aphasia Awareness Month is a really wonderful step. Of course, and I'm so glad to have this discussion with you. Now, I understand that the NAA recognizes intersectionality, which is so um, important and is a very huge thing, especially, um, you know, as today we are becoming just a little bit more aware of all the challenges that, you know, different people face. You know, can you just explain why highlighting how other adversities could impact those with aphasia and basically why that's important? Sure. So, you know, people with aphasia identify as having aphasia, but they identify with lots of other groups as well. And, uh, that, you know, we're multifaceted. People with aphasia are heterogeneous, right? So there's not just one type of person who has aphasia. So we have our other affiliations. And um, <clears throat> so that is certainly relevant, and the NAA really works to support that. Um, there is a, for example, there is a community group supported by the NAA that meets. It's the Black American Aphasia Community Group where people come and talk they in a community group they talk about whatever they'd like to talk about certainly issues related to their aphasia and 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 um, very likely issues related to being a black person with aphasia. I ran a men's aphasia group once and in that group um, the focus was on you know communication and the individuals talked about what they wanted to talk about but they also talked about what it was like to be a man and changing roles within their family. So we you know have we're heterogeneous individuals and we have you know different ways that we define ourselves and certainly um, the NAA supports that. And I'm really glad to hear that because I think that sometimes when um, it comes to health, a lot of organizations just focus on the health aspect, but focusing on the social aspect and how it affects us socially, I think is just super important. It's really great to highlight that because uh, people don't just exist within a vacuum and just um, experience this condition by itself. It, it also affects how we interact with the world. So I think that's so amazing. You know, I'm curious to know what are healthcare providers doing now to support people with this condition? Um, yeah, I want to just comment on oh, yeah, this. Of so that's something that you um, I thought of as you were leading into that. There's a philosophy or an approach to aphasia rehabilitation called the life participation approach to aphasia. So yes, we educate our patients and we work with our patients as healthcare professionals. My training is as a speech language pathologist and speech language pathologists are the individuals trained to work with people with communication disorders. I specialize with aphasia. Um, and um, while we work with restoring language, we do restorative behavioral treatment approaches as well as compensatory approaches, we also work with participating in life, just like you were alluding to. So um, we not only work sp specifically and directly on language and communication, we work on that in the real world and we really educate people and families about that as well and really work with families in terms of helping them support their loved ones as they are living with aphasia. One thing I always tell my patients is recovery is lifelong. A little bit of a double-edged sword, right? The positive thing is that there is recovery, you know, but the suggestion there is that it takes a long time. Um, but I see it, I, I can tend to go at the positive end of that, that it is lifelong and that we are living our lives with aphasia and constantly changing and improving as we move through life. And can you expand on what recovery looks like or what treatment may look like? Sure. So um, 
often when someone has a non-progressive aphasia, they are just walking around like you and me, a regular life, they have a stroke, they end up in the emergency room, they end up in the hospital, they wake up and they can't talk or they're having a lot of difficulty talking. The first time they've ever heard of aphasia, most people, right? Yeah. And so those early days, um, there's a lot going on. You know, they're just, you know, recovering from like the trauma that has happened to them. Um, usually people recover kind of some aspect of their language pretty quickly after that. Um, and then after, you know, the, those first um, acute stages of post-stroke with aphasia are the first three months. And then after three months, we're in the chronic stages. It varies people's recovery in the first um, chronic, in the chronic stage after three months post-stroke. But one, a take-home message that I want to tell you and our listeners here is that recovery occurs after a year post-stroke. People come in and they're so worried about that first year or they're fo so worried about that first six months that they're thinking like if I don't you know, improve, if I'm not where I want to be, that I'm not going to improve. And that is not true. Research shows that people make gains in the chronic stages one year, two years, more than that post-stroke. So that's important to know that there are gains made. Our treatment sessions, to tell you what we do, we work on um, training specific linguistic tasks, training verbs in different sentence structures, um, really work on exploring s the semantic features of words in a pure linguistic task to help people retrieve the words that they're having trouble. Anomia is word finding difficulty. And that is a salient characteristic of all types of aphasia. While there's some specific types of aphasia, word finding difficulty or anomia is a symptom of aphasia that is common in all types of aphasia. So we always work on anomia or word finding. That's amazing. And, and I definitely just want to highlight, you know, how grateful I am that we're, you know, here to have this discussion because this was my first time, you know, hearing about this condition. Um, and so I want to thank you so much for, you know, joining the community and kind of educating us on, you know, um, about, you know, so many people who are living with this condition. So thank you. Thank you. To learn more about the work the association is doing, please visit their website at aphasia.org. Aphasia we have to take a quick break, but we'll be back with more Open after this. Hello, my name is Tyrone Lowe. I host a show at Bronx that call The Legends, where I bring real legends, DJs, upcoming artists, actually people from the past. That was that's into entertainment. Um, I want to thank BronxNet. First of all, I want to thank you know, I want to thank you know for the 30 years of of the actually being active here. It has opened a lot of doors for me to the point where I'm branching off to have my own network. Fulfill your dreams here. That's all I have to say. Hey everyone, it's your girl Kat from the Kitty Rose Lifestyle also from the next chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey every week right here at BronxNet, Saturdays at 11 p.m. Wow, 30 years. 30 years of BronxNet public access television. I'm a girl from Brooklyn and came to the Bronx 25 years ago, started my journey on BronxNet on public access television in 2016. And BronxNet is where I got my start. BronxNet, I feel like, is a home away from home. They support all of my endeavors, and I wouldn't have been able to be on any of the other channels if it wasn't for the fundamentals that I learned right here at my start here at BronxNet. So I am so appreciative. My son says I should stop telling people I'm from Brooklyn because I've been here now, Bronx Swarm, for 22 years. So I'm so grateful and I wish you much success in 30 years, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 more. Because public access is necessary so that people like myself can have a voice. Yes, BronxNet, it's your girl Kat from Kitty Rose. Check me out every Saturday at 11 p.m. right here, Channel 68, the next chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Mwah. Welcome back. As we recognize the importance of Pride Month, we highlight organizations like GLAD. GLAD is the largest LGBTQ nonprofit media organization. Today, they join us to discuss the launch of their latest campaign with Ground Media, Here We Are. The video campaign combats misinformation about transgender people and amplifies trans visibility. Before we meet our guests, let's take a look at this heartwarming video. 71% of Americans say they have never met a transgender person. Here I am. 
Growing up was fun. My friends were always over. My cousins were always over. It was a lot of people in and out. It kind of prepared us just for embracing all kinds of people in the world. As transgender people, sometimes we forget that the journey is not just ours. My family, no matter what, we always loved each other. It wasn't hard for me to accept my brother. It was definitely an adjustment. Is transgender a real identity? 100%. Is it the end all of who people are? Absolutely not. Trans people are just people. We're joyful and we just want to live and thrive and be. I just want people to understand that literal lives are at stake. We can all just live freely if we respect and honor one another. We all have the right to be ourselves without fear. Help us share this story. Shane Diamond of GLAD and U.S. Air Force Fed and community advocate Geo, tell me more about this effort. I want to thank you both so much for joining me. Oh my gosh, thank you for having us. It's great to be in studio and I'm so glad Geo could join us via Skype. Now, um, what inspired the creation and the launch of Here We Are campaign? And I understand, I want to reiterate, it's with Ground Media as well. It's a collaboration. So can you tell us a little bit more about this collab um, and the campaign in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ground and GLAAD have been working together uh, on this campaign for about a year, um, trying to add to our roster of transgender storytellers that can help introduce audiences and more Americans to real transgender people. In 2023, GLAAD released a study called Accelerating Acceptance that uh, revealed that 71% of Americans say that they've never met a trans person that they know of. Um, and trans people like me, like Geo, we are here, we are in communities. Um, and so this campaign is really helping to facilitate some of those introductions to bring communities together that might not uh, normally meet and to help uh, change some of those statistics and, and introduce more trans people to our, our greater communities. Now, as you mentioned, 71% of Americans claim they've never met someone who's transgender, which I could imagine is um, a tricky statistic, right? Because how can you um, automatically know? But I understand um, the idea behind, you know, the number. You know, how will this campaign address misconceptions about what it means to be trans in America? That's a really great question. And I appreciate the, like, nuance in the question, right? Because 71% of Americans say they've never met a trans person that they know of. Um, <clears throat> if you met me on the street, you might not guess that I'm trans. Um, I uh, am assumed to be cisgender, so not transgender, cisgender. Um, and we, trans people, we are out here, we are you know, on your teams, we are in your classrooms, we're working alongside you. Um, and there's no one way to look transgender. There's no one way to be transgender. And so really trying to help disrupt some of the, the narratives and the misinformation, especially from uh, people who oppose equality, um, to change the, what it looks like and, and what it sounds like um, to have more transgender people in our communities. And this video campaign and the bravery from Gio, Ashton, and Nadia to share their stories along with their families helps do this in a way that highlights and increases visibility, but doesn't require a bunch of one-on-one -on -one conversations to facilitate these intros. Thank you so much. And I want to, uh, you know, kind of get to Geo and, you know, talk about, you know, can you just explain how anti-transgender rhetoric from politicians have affected members, you know, of this community, but kind of also kind of added to those misconceptions that we hear about trans people in America? Absolutely. Um, again, thank you for having me here. But many of us live in states where that rhetoric is kind of the foundation I am based in Ohio, which is pretty much a red state right now. And folks here are thinking that way also. And they feel like transgender people should not be able to live their authentic lives. There are plenty of bans and bills that are happening across the country that we're seeing where the rights of transgender people are being taken away. And the charges being led by politicians, you know, it is often being targeted towards youth um, and those who are playing sports. And so what we are seeing is people are bullying children and they're bullying transgender people and they're trying to erase our identities. Now, can you expand on the importance of highlighting the transgender experience within the LGBTQ community? Yes, you know, as someone who is black and transgender, it is you know, extremely hard oftentimes because what we see still is the T being left off 
in the community or um, a lot of segregation still within the community. And again, this is just my experience in seeing it, but we want to talk about how, if we're going to talk about pride and we're going to celebrate pride, pride started as a riot and it started as a riot from black and brown trans women and trans people. So being able to highlight the history within the transgender community and the history of what pride and the community itself is, we cannot do any of that without talking about transgender people and highlighting us. Thank you. Now, Shane, can you just expand on the creative decision or why was there a creative decision to release 60 second videos? We have short attention spans. Um, so a 60 second video trying to communicate uh, what it means to be trans. Here are some people. These are their stories. M facilitating some of those introductions. Gio's in this in the series and the campaign with his sister. Nadia is featured with both of her parents. Ashton is with his dad. So 60 seconds is a long time in TikTok land, but it's not a long <laughs> time um, in terms of making introductions and, and welcoming people um, into our lives and into our stories. So a 60 second spot uh, is great for social media. Um, it's great to be able to include in shows like this. Um, again, we're so grateful to be here. Um, we do have a 30 second version that we're also releasing and we're really excited that's gonna be on some major broadcast networks. So uh, don't skip all the commercials next time you're uh, yeah. watching TV or streaming something because um, we'll have some of these videos uh, interspersed in there as well. That's amazing. And Gio, can you tell me a little bit more about your participation in the Here We Are campaign? Yes, um, I was just approached to tell my story. I'm someone who often speaks about my experience as a black trans person, as a community advocate, as a military veteran. So when this opportunity presented itself, I thought it was extremely important and I was excited to be a part of it. Now, I want to hear from both of you, and Shane, you can go first. Can you talk about the importance of featuring family and support um, in these segments? Um, I know that, you know, sometimes when we talk about hardship, there's um, a feeling of uh, sadness sometimes when we talk about, you know, just any marginalized communities. But I thought it was really um, refreshing and, and really nice to see positive stories, you know, come from the community. So can you talk about the importance of highlighting that as well? It is so important now to create stories that include trans joy, that include stories of love, of happiness, of uh, people coming across a table to share a meal or prepare a meal. This is what we all want in our lives. We all want joy, we all want ease, we want happiness, we want love. That's often not what trans people are being told uh, is we're allowed to have for our experience by the media. Um, and so we really, really wanted to prioritize telling positive, joyful stories, giving kids and other trans people an opportunity to, to see something and aspire to have that, um, to show what a loving family looks like, and also to talk about how it's not always easy. Family isn't always easy. Sometimes we disagree. Um, sometimes we take a second to learn about each other and come back together. Um, but family is what binds us together, and family is ultimately where we, we find our safety and comfort. And so being able to include stories with loving families, with trans joy, with siblings, with parents, is so important because it not only reinforces that trans people um, are deserving of love and happiness and joy, but that it's possible for those who are out there seeking it. Um, and Gio, I'd love to hear from you. What was that experience like, you know, sharing this moment with your sister? Um, and, you know, uh, again, you know, talking about trans joy and kind of showing something that's a little bit more light and positive for pride. Yeah, um, I have a very close family. Um, my sister and I are super close. She's so amazing. And I'm extremely thankful for her, her willingness to always be a part of these things. I think it also was amazing because my sister is an absolute true um, ally and she does that in action. And I think this was a great point for her to be able to be a part of something to continue to show her allyship when she's talking about how she's an ally. So it's not just about me as this trans person, but it's also about her and being able to say, I support my brother, but I support my brother in all of these ways. Um, and I think it's extremely important for people to see that we do have families. We do have families that love us. I'm a person who loves to thrive on trans joy. You know, we're gonna talk about 
what is hard for trans people, but I don't like to live there. I like to hit the points and move on and live my most authentic, joyful life all the time. And so I think it's extremely important for the world to see that. Um, and Gio, I, I definitely want to hear your opinion on this. Um, in 2022, Glad poll of LGBTQ Americans, 72% of transgender participants said the current political environment made them fear for their safety. Can you just tell us a little bit more, you know, in your own experience, you know, how you kind of handle hearing something like this and what people, especially young people in this community should do when they hear stuff like that? Well, it's absolutely true. Um, again, I've been working in public policy for a long time. I'm currently uh, finishing a degree in political science. And so this is something that I am constantly watching and taking note of. And it is um, extremely deafening to hear sometimes what politicians are saying and how they feel about um, transgender people and LGBTQ people as a whole. Um, but what I do try to tell the youth and young adults is not everyone thinks that way. Um, the best way to kind of combat that is to find your community, find your support system, find joy in your life, be able to continuously um, show that you're not going to be defeated. Try not to walk around in the world with a target um, intentionally on your back. Thank you so much for that. And I, th I definitely think it's something um, that young people especially need to hear. So thank you again for kind of expanding on that. Now, Shane, can you tell us a little bit more about where people can kind of interact with this more and just learn more about this amazing campaign? Um, people, we hope that people share these videos far and wide. So they're available on our website, the campaign website, herewearenow.com. Um, from there, you'll be able to watch videos with Gio and his sister, with Ashton and his dad, with Nadia and her parents, and be able to share that out uh, via email, on social media, uh, to your various websites. Um, and you'll learn more as we up continue to update that website with more and more transgender storytellers and their families as this campaign continues to grow and build momentum. Uh, throughout the year, we are queer, not just in June. Uh, this happens all year round for us, and so we want to continue creating content and telling stories of transgender people throughout the year. And then can you please just let us know, you know, what do you hope people learn from the campaign? Ashton says one, something in one of his videos that I think really sticks with me, which is that we all have more in common than we are different. And I hope that people can watch these videos, get to meet Gio, Ashton, Nadia, and their families, and really see that transgender people have more in common with, with cis people, that we all have more in common with each other than we have different, um, and to have a little bit of empathy for those who might be different from us, and how can we lift up and support those around us, especially if we are not facing the same struggles. Well, Gio and Shane, I want to thank you both so much for joining me and having this discussion. Um, and congratulations on this campaign. I think it's amazing. You're doing amazing work. So thank you both once again. Thank you so much, Kibben. If you, would you. Like, if you would like to learn more about this campaign and to hear more about Geo and all of the stories, please go to the website www.herewearenow.com. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you miss any part of today's show, you can catch a rehable cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum Channel 67 and Verizon Fios Channel 33 or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Darren Heine on Wednesday and with Rena Valentine on Friday. I am Kevin Aline wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.